Hello, and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D, and I talk about its lore, and its history, and what it's like to fight in-game as well. These videos are based on your suggestions, which you leave down in the comment section below in these videos. And today's is no different. Today's video was actually suggested by Jan Kohler around a whole year ago. So they've been very patiently waiting for this ever since. But then my patrons over on Patreon vote for which monster they'd like to see me draw in what particular order. So it's my patrons that Jan has to thank for having their request up on screen today. Although I have been very excited about this one, I have to say. But if you'd like more control over what kind of videos you see from me, which monsters get picked, and I'd urge you to head over to my Patreon page because backers at all levels get access to my Monster Monday list and can pick which ones they can vote to pick, which monsters I do in what order. And your support really, really helps this channel and helps me to make videos for you every single Monday. So if you choose to do that, I very much appreciate it. But if not, I hope you'll enjoy the video anyway. Now, I was actually talking to a member of my D&D group about weird and ridiculous monsters the other day. And he asked where all the kind of bizarre and goofy creatures are in my Monster Mondays, because I tend to do the kind of creepy ones. Well, I say that. Aside from intellect of errors, which turned out a bit more horrifying than ridiculous, I feel like it's been ages, maybe since the flump, I guess, that we've had one of D&D's classic, unquestioningly weird monsters. So perhaps we are overdue. But weird and ridiculous looking, the frog Hemoth has in spades, as well as his name. It's just fun to say, frog Hemoth. So hopefully this will satisfy my group's desire to see the weirder side of D&D. So what are frog hemoths? Well, they're huge, unaligned monstrosities, said to be in the neighborhood of an elephant's height. They very loosely resemble massive frogs who's, who traditionally have two powerful back legs that they use to walk upright and four massive tentacles on their upper bodies. Making these amphibious anomalies even weirder, they also have three eyes on the top of their heads which can protrude from their fleshy, slimy skulls like a snail's eye stalks. But if all of that isn't weird enough, this creature is actually an alien. Now, aliens have cropped up in a few of my videos, notably the Gith, things like Slads and Elithids, but Frog Hemoths actually joined D&D in First Edition's Expedition to the Barrier Peaks module in 1980. This is one of the most controversial modules in D&D history because it was written by Gary Gygax in an effort to introduce players to sci-fi or sort of science fantasy, I guess, elements, and also to promote Gary's friend and fellow game designer Jim Ward's sci-fi role-playing game Metamorphosis Alpha at the Origins Game Convention in Columbus, Ohio. And as I've alluded to, the reception of this module was mixed overall because it featured, well, aliens, ray guns, a crashed spaceship, which, while some loved, others felt was an intrusion in their otherwise Lord of the Rings or Conan the Barbarian-style fantasy adventures, what they were used to in D&D and what they had come to D&D for. So yeah, despite the word frog being in their name, these lumbering amphibious hulks aren't frogs in any respect. This doesn't, however, stop frog-like creatures native to your D&D world from welcoming them as one of their own. We're told that in Volo's Guide to Monsters, where these creatures appear in 5th edition, that frog hemoths are often worshipped by bullywugs as gods or sometimes trained as weapons of war if they can be convinced to follow the leadership of a bullywug tribe. Frog hemoths aren't easy to train or capture, though. They understand no languages that we know of, and with an intelligence of two, they're not likely to learn, so that throws communication out of the window, and their strength 23 creatures with 16d12 plus 80 HP. So making a bad first impression with them is likely to end in disaster. But interestingly, these creatures are unaligned. They're more beast-like, so they're more likely than a lot of monsters to be convinced of your virtues and stop grinding your bones to dust if you end up in combat with one they're not evil not inherently and your dm may not necessarily play them as aggressive creatures so how does a bullywug tribe or more importantly because i know dnd players how do you and your party befriend this absolute juggernaut of slime well, we're told that they're perpetually starving creatures, desperate to cram as much food as they can find into their enormous, gaping mouths. 
They're so intensely food motivated and so open-minded, we'll say, in terms of their culinary range, that they're not above devouring their own young. In fact, we're told that frog hemoths reproduce asexually, laying a massive, single, fertile egg every few years, and that the parent is utterly, utterly indifferent and has no attachment to it. As such, it may eat the eggs if it is hungry at that time, which is extraordinarily likely, or perhaps they'll leave it to fend for itself, and those tend to be the lucky ones. But an asexually reproducing, massive, eternally hungry monster that is omnivorous, will just eat absolutely anything it finds. If it weren't for this cannibalism, I can imagine that a lot of worlds out there, if your D&D players end up going planet exploring, will just be, or would just be, absolutely filled with frog hemoths and nothing left, were it not for the fact that they devour their own young, and therefore limit their own population control. Interestingly, on the nature of this whole asexual reproduction, amphibians, including frogs, have been known to reproduce asexually, in the wild through a process called parthenogenesis, where the offspring grow into a single unisex species once they hatch. Following their hatching, frog hemoths grow incredibly rapidly, provided that they have enough food, or manage to find it somehow, to throw into their gullets, and will actually grow and reach maturity in only a few months. Now, they're always quite ridiculous looking in the monster manual and, well, I suppose, time of foes, isn't it? Because although they are incredibly terrifying creatures through the lore of them and their appetites. They have these two little stumpy legs. And also it's the eyes. I think it's the eyes that make them look particularly ridiculous in most depictions. Something which I don't think I'll be able to overcome. Their eyes protrude from the tops of their heads from a single stalk usually, and they use it kind of like a little periscope. While they're growing, they are vulnerable because they're not their enormous, massive, elephant-sized frog monster yet. So they tend to lurk in swamps and hide in the mud and the water, and they protrude these little periscopic eyes from out of the water to look around for danger. Now, at the time of recording this, I haven't actually done my drawing, so I don't know which way I will go with it, but inherently I am leaning towards something like a snail's eyes. Well, I was mostly thinking of snail's eyes because of this, well, retractable nature. We all know when you were a kid, perhaps you will have intentionally or accidentally touched a snail's eye and watched it recede back into the body. This tiny little pinhole of light for a pupil being the only thing uh, discernible as an eye compared to the otherwise skin-like surface, which I think suits tentacles and things like that very, very well. And as well, a slimy, amphibious, alien body I think a snail's eye would fit on top of very, very well. And if it was a bit more prehensile, a bit more mobile, being able to look around corners and things like that in case there is prey nearby, or perhaps while they're growing, they might need to look out for predators. But I quite like the idea of a frog hemoth having its eyes sort of close to its skull, close to its head, if it has a skull, close to its head anyway, uh, when it's not looking for food, perhaps while it's in attack mode, maybe while you're fighting, its eyes won't protrude too much. A, to keep them safe, and B, because eyes are very, very important to frogs, and I really wanted to have a frog's beautiful eyes uh, in this drawing somewhere. Frogs that are born in water, naturally, will have their eyes develop multiple times throughout their lives. They can actually regenerate the tissue of their eyes, if they get damaged, but also light travels much slower through water than it does through air. So when frogs transition from a tadpole into a land-dwelling creature, their eyes actually need to flatten slightly and almost completely be reformed and reshaped in order to accommodate this new light that they're experiencing and to take everything in. They're much larger than our eyes comparative to our bodies because they need to be able to find sustenance and I think that rings true for the frog hemoth. But also, even though a lot of frogs do actually have teeth with which to hold their prey in their mouths, you'll notice that almost all frogs when they eat will sort of close their eyes and they actually use their eyes to compress and hold their food in their mouths while they're trying to digest and eat them. They'll actually force their eyes inwards slightly impressing them with their multiple eyelids. They have one set to be able to look underwater, this kind of transparent set, and one side to fully close their eyes. And their eyes are so massive that they almost form like a vice when they have food inside their mouths. So maybe 
it might be worth giving a frog hemoth a better chance, maybe advantage with perception checks when it's fighting and it can have its eyes on stalks looking all around it in 360 degrees, all these little prehensile eyes. But maybe if it eats someone or eats something and it has something in its mouth, the eyes retract try and hold this creature in and maybe it has or maybe it has disadvantage on perception checks and things like that perhaps it's easier to backstab when it's already eating someone because it'll be using these eyes to hold in its prey that reminds me i've not talked about this creature's stats yet what it can do well i've already mentioned their massive strength and their huge amount of hit points and it almost goes without saying that they're amphibious breathing underwater swimming comes very naturally to them but in terms of what kind of damage this thing is going to deal to you it has a multi-attack, so it can make two attacks per round. Well, I suppose three, really. It makes two attacks with its tentacles, but it can also use an attack from its tongue or its bite. So its tentacles are a plus 10 to hit. They reach 20 feet, and they deal 3d8 plus 6 bludgeoning damage. But they also grapple things, because naturally, these are the shovels with which they use to put food in their mouths. And as a player, you could be grappled, ready to be thrown into its massive mouth. And this could be an absolutely terrible fate. But one thing that's often overlooked is the fact that this creature has four tentacles. And if you don't want people to be smashed to pieces by tentacle attacks, you can always occupy its tentacles by being grappled by them. It only has four things with which to make these attacks. And it can't do that if those tentacles are fully grappled. But it gets to make two of those bludgeoning attacks per turn. And then it can choose between a bite or a tongue attack. The tongue often looks like a kind of squid's tentacle with this kind of fan or heart-shaped end and a lot of either very sticky suckers, perhaps resembling a chameleon's tongue, or sharp spikes with which to grip things. But essentially the tongue attack isn't something that has to roll to hit with. Any creature that it can see within 20 feet of it needs to make a strength saving throw. And if they failed, the frog hemoth can pull them to an unoccupied space within five feet of the frog hemoth. And then as a bonus action, it can make a bite attack. And a bite attack is the thing you really want to worry about with a frog hemoth. It's a plus 10 to hit attack that deals 3d10 plus 6 piercing damage and if the creature is medium or smaller which means you as a player you are swallowed you're blinded and restrained you have total cover against attacks and other effects from outside the frog hemoth standard issue a swallowing move and you consistently take 3d6 acid damage at the start of each of the frog hemoth's turns passively as you are digested slowly unless the frog hemoth takes 20 damage or more in a single turn from you while you're inside it and this beast is so massive its stomach so huge that it can hold two creatures in its stomach but if you manage to do this damage as might being restrained and blinded and all the other myriad of conditions that occur while you're being digested by this creature, it still gets to make a constitution saving throw, a really ridiculously hard one. But it does have a plus five in constitution and a plus nine in con saving throws. And if it passes, it does not throw you up, meaning you could be in there until it dies, really. At which point you're no longer restrained, its stomach laxes and loosens, and you can carve your way out or crawl back through its mouth, your armour and flesh corroded by the stomach acids within. Which seems like a fairly gruesome fate. But the frog hemoth does have one particular weakness. Its wet and amphibious body is susceptible to lightning. And I say susceptible because it's not vulnerable. In fact, it is resistant to fire and lightning damage, so it's always going to take half damage from these kind of attacks. However, if you deal lightning damage to it, we're told that this creature suffers several effects until the end of its next turn, including its speed being halved, it has a minus two penalty to its AC and dexterity saving throws. Can't use reactions, so it can't do another one of those bites after a tongue attack or a multi-attack on its turn. And it can either use an action or a bonus action, but not both. So despite the fact that it doesn't do very much damage, lightning is the way to go to really slow this creature down and to render it almost completely useless. So I hope that tip saves you from the stomach of a frog hemoth one day. Anyway. I hope you enjoyed today's video, guys. I really did enjoy drawing the frog hemoth, reimagining this creature, even if it doesn't end up being too different from the Monster Manual version. And I hope you enjoyed going back to some of the more ridiculous and weird creatures in D&D and not always having to do the threatening and horrifying ones even though a frog hemoth is a pretty horrifying way to die. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll give it a little like, a little thumbs up down below. 
maybe favorite this video and share it with the rest of your party. I hope you'll also take a chance to subscribe and hit the little bell icon as well because I make videos like this every single Monday. All of that really, really helps this channel to grow to let YouTube's algorithm know that I'm doing a good job if you do enjoy this stuff. So thank you very, very much if you choose to do that. And these videos are made with the kind support of viewers like you who choose to become my patrons over on Patreon as well. And as a thank you, I give them all sorts of rewards, including the ability to vote on which monsters they'd like to see me draw in what order, digital prints of all of these monsters that I do each month, and things like one-on-one -on -one chats and exclusive live streams. So if you'd like to tip me the price of a cup of coffee, or even more than that, and those rewards sound appealing to you, and you'd like to help me make more videos like this every single week, then I hope you'll take a look at my Patreon. I very, very much appreciate that. But until next time, guys, I hope you don't stray too far into a swamp that you become dinner for a frog hemoth, and happy monster hunting. Mm -hmm.